Hello, and welcome to Ed Talks with Khan Academy, where we talk to influential people in the field of education. I am excited today to talk with Dr. Dan Willingham. Before we get started with that, I want to remind all of you that Khan Academy is a nonprofit that relies on donations from folks like yourself to help help us help keep more people learning. And you can find the, the space to donate there on, on our site. Also, during the pandemic, we have required some extra support to help keep us going and make sure that all learners have those opportunities that they've needed for digital learning in this, in this time. And we wanna particularly thank Bank of America, AT&T, Google.org, Novartis, Fastly, and General Motors for their support. All thankful for all of that, all of that help. And finally, we want to uh, remind you that there's an audio version of our Ed Talks that's available, Homeroom with Sal, the podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. So take a look at that. You can find previous episodes and, and review favorites while you're, while you're looking for those. So today, as I said, I'm excited to talk to Dr. Dan Willingham. When people ask me, hey, where can I read more about learning science and how people learn, his book, Why Don't Students Like School? It's one of the first place I send places I send people to. And the second edition of that book is out this week. So go find that at your favorite bookseller. And it, in addition to the, all of the good previous content, it also covers educational technology, which is, of course, a, a place uh, that uh, is dear and dear to my heart. But uh, Dan, welcome, and thanks for joining us. Hi, Kristen. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I'm going to, as usual in these talks, start off with some questions that I have from uh, re reading your works, and then we'll go to audience questions. So those of you who are listening, feel free to add things and questions into the chat, and I will pick those up as well. But I'm interested in starting and thinking about curiosity, which is something that you talk about up front in, in one of your first chapters. And thinking about, it's there's things that it seems like we're curious about, and there's some natural curiosity when you think about young kids asking questions and where that is. But then sometimes it seems to kind of fade away, and there's the, like we kind of lose some of that. So how should we think about curiosity and helping us learn? So yeah, curiosity is one of the things that I just find so fascinating because I, I noticed this in myself before I was a cognitive psychologist or studied things like uh, studying any of these things formally. Uh, we think of curiosity as being driven by content. And so you think like, I'm a cognitive psychologist, so I am curious about cognitive psychology. And the truth is like, that's sort of true, but not <laughs> remotely true uh, as a general rule. I have been to many, many conferences and attended cognitive psychology talks and found myself extraordinarily bored. And I'm sure everybody listening to this talk now has had the same experience. You, you, you go into something, you start reading a book or you watch a YouTube video because you're like, oh, I love this talk. This is going to be great. And then it's horrible. And then the opposite can equally uh, hap happen equally often where somebody, you know, sort of forces you to watch a YouTube video about how they make dumbbells and you're like, that can't be interesting. And then, oh my God, it's totally fascinating. Right? So I think the through line for curiosity, you mentioned kids and how kids seem to be curious about everything. And then like we adults, not so much, we're much more selective. The kind of through line for that, I think, is curiosity is all about learning about your environment. And so we are continually sizing up our environment and figuring out, is this um, is there an opportunity for learning here? And learning, um, uh, the, the, the way you make that calculation is it, uh, the, the unknown needs to be at sort of just the right level. Um, so if you offer me some information and it's a topic, like if you said to me, hey, would you like to know who the first president of the US is? I'm like, that doesn't make me very curious because I already have that information, right? Likewise, if you said, would you like to know who the first president of you know, Chad was? I'm like, 
sort of, but like, I really don't know anything about Chad. And so that's not going to help me very much. So it's when there's information that's going to add to what we already know that seems to be a really critical trigger for curiosity and that helps us understand why small children are curious about everything they don't know anything and so there's like they can they are um, uh, well positioned to be sponges and be curious about everything because the world is offering all this information uh, and they don't know anything about the world that's great so as you said, you're a cognitive psychologist and a professor of psychology. What was your path to getting to that place in your career? How did you come to be a cognitive psychologist? I came to be, it was, it was very much a matter of curiosity. Um, both my parents uh, were actually psychologists, neither one of them a cognitive psychologist, but they both um, had degrees in experimental psychology. My dad went off and became a psychometrician. My mother later became a counselor. Um, and my uncle was also an experimental psychologist. So like, I was really determined not to do anything to, in psychology at all. Um, but then in college, I thought, gosh, I guess I, I need to take like intro to psychology or something so that I can keep up at Thanksgiving dinner. Um, so I did, and I found myself absolutely fascinated. And then I started taking, you know, a broad array of courses. Uh, and cognitive psychology just really, uh, just really, I, I want to say caught my fancy, which is is a weird turn of phrase, but that pretty well describes it. Um, I just couldn't get enough of it, uh, and so decided to go to graduate school and just keep doing what I loved. That's great, and I love the. I don't want anything to do with what my parents did, but yeah. oh, it's actually kind of interesting too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so thinking generally across your education experience, were there any particular teachers who influenced you or that you found really uh, helped you on your path? I mean, gosh, I had so many um, amazing teachers. I mentioned uh, that I, uh, was really captivated by cognitive psychology in college. Um, and Ruth Day was the professor who taught that course. And I took a psychology of language course afterwards with her. I did a senior thesis with her. So she was certainly um, extremely influential in um, developing my love of psychology. I also have to single out um, my fifth grade t teacher, Richard Lewer, uh, who was just a really, really inspiring teacher. and really made me come to school uh, excited to learn every day and also really managed to help me see that um, school was something I was doing for myself. I think up until that point, I kind of went to school just because like you're a kid and that's what you do. And like to the extent that I had any skin in the game, so to speak, it was like I was doing this to make my parents happy. Like if, my, if I didn't go, my parents would be mad at me. And Mr. Lewer actually really made me see that learning was something that was fun and something that I appreciated and something I benefited from. Um, so, you know, I couldn't tell you exactly what content I learned in fifth grade from him, but I uh, will never forget that sort of attitude towards school and that attitude towards learning. That's great. Uh, actually, when people ask me about um, teachers myself, my fifth grade teacher was also very influential in what we did. Nice. So I wonder, too, if there's something about that age that uh, gets people. Um, so you, we were talking about how that that kind of um, inspiration, but also building on what you learned and what you know and where those are. So there's a lot of we talk about in motivation finding uh, meaning for learning, and one of the things that can help motivate students is finding meaning in what they're doing. And I know lots of teachers get the question of when am I going to use this? Why do I need this? Yeah. How should we help build meaning and what do we do when it seems like the things that we need to learn don't have a lot of meaning in them? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I comment on this a little bit in um, Why Don't Students Like School? And in a way, it's a, it's a stance that concerns me a little bit. Um, I don't feel like uh, will students find this meaningful now is a very good litmus test to, uh, to which we should hold content. And the reason for that is I think there's a lot of things that students 
uh, will enjoy knowing, will find beautiful, will uh, maybe even find important that they don't feel find meaningful in their life as, as they would describe it. In other words, if you try and tempt them with, look, this is something that uh, is important for you to know is in, and you're going to find it interesting and important in your daily life. I think, first of all, I think a lot of times that's going to be feel really strained for us uh, because a lot of what we as adults kind of in, in our much more mature judgment think this is important for a fifth grader to learn about. Um, it's not immediately obvious to the fifth grader that yes, that's going to be meaningful to me. But in contrast, we can, we were talking about curiosity. You can make people curious about things to say like, look, here's this puzzle. Here's this odd, uh, here's this fact in mathematics. Like how, why does it work that way? Or here's this fact in science. Why, what is that all about? Um, I think that's a more, when we're talking about motivation, Yes, things seeming personally meaningful, personally relevant to me, that can be powerful. Um, but I think that will greatly narrow the scope of what it is we want students uh, to know about. I also worry a little bit, uh, candidly, that it, it uh, sends an implicit message that the students are kind of in the driver's seat. In other words, if I'm continually trying to show students this is meaningful to you, this is meaningful, that also sort of implies the contra, the, um, the counterpoint that, well, if I don't think it's meaningful, then that maybe means I shouldn't be learning it. Um, and I, I don't think that uh, fifth graders should have that uh, control. I think that teachers are the ones who should be deciding this is what's important for you to learn right now and it's incumbent on me to make you intrigued about it. Interesting. So I just, as you were talking, had this thought, as you said that about them not deciding, it also triggered in me some of the conversations around um, diversity and inclusion and that just because it's not relevant to me, let's say the you know, uh, upper middle class white fifth grader in the suburban school doesn't mean that it's not something that I should know to be able to understand the experiences of other people too um, and where that is. So I wonder if there's a link there. I, I agree. And I mean, I, I think that's especially um, point, not poignant, but it's especially important to consider uh, in the realm of human experience. To, so, so to sort of say like, what do I have to learn about this story that's about somebody who's totally unlike me? Like, no, that's kind of the point is, first of all, you're, you, uh, it's interesting and important to learn about the perspectives of people from other cultures, people who are not like you. And second of all, you're gonna see some similarities that maybe you didn't expect, that there is universality in the human experience. And how are you gonna know that um, and, unless you read about some people who are different than you are. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. Um, I do want to get a little bit to talking about um, in the, the, the realm of technology. So in COVID and we've, you know, even more started relying on digital learning environments. And one of the things that we hear sometimes is, are all of these phones and screens changing how people learn? Are they getting different dopamine hits? Are our attention spans changing? Um, right. What are your thoughts on that? Well, there's a lot of pieces, you know, j just in your question, right? There was really like three different <laughs> questions in there um, about whether, you know, are screens changing our brains? Do we learn? Let's, let's take those two questions. Are screens changing our brains? And then do we learn differently from screens? Um, the idea that screens are changing our brains, uh, I've argued that's very improbable. And the reason I argue that the, the main way that people have suspected that screens are changing our brains is that they are reducing attention span uh, or, and or reducing uh, working memory span. Uh, first of all, we have data that that's not happening. So there's certain tests of working memory that have been administered for close to 100 years. And so we actually have data from limited populations, not you know worldwide or anything. Uh, but we certainly have Amer American samples and we know that working memory span just hasn't changed uh, with the digital revolution. So we actually have data on that. And then also from a theoretical perspective, um, you 
just wouldn't expect the brain is plastic this is frequently what you hear the brain is plastic and so how could it not change in response to the uh, all this experience with screens um and what i would say to that is the brain is plastic but it can't be that plastic so take working memory in particular there's so many cognitive processes that depend on working memory reading problem solving uh, mathematics all the things we care about in school basically really depend on working memory capacity so if working memory capacity were really plastic and really changed with the environment and it shrunk the impact would cascade throughout the cognitive system and basically uh it, everybody would be really stupid if working memory capacity shrunk significantly now, in terms of whether or not we learn differently from screens, it's pretty clear that we do. Um, and uh, just think about Zoom fatigue. That's enough to start you with. I mean, this is what everybody has found during the pandemic. Uh, the signal that you're getting from a screen is not as rich as the signal that you get from a live human being. And so one of the ways you're dealing with that is you're expending more cognitive effort trying to make up for that signal. The, uh, you know, you don't, for one thing, you frequently don't have gestures. You can occasionally see me. I sort of self-consciously am trying to keep my hands up here so you can <laughs> getting a little bit more signal from that. Frequently though, you know, you're, you're looking at a talking head, you're not getting any gestures. Um, the the two-dimensionality obviously makes a difference. Um, the, you get a lag. There's all these problems with, uh, with screens. And so what the viewer is doing is they're expending more cognitive energy trying to extract everything they can from that signal. Um, so learning from screens and they're, when little kids are not very good at this, little kids really get, uh, have problems with screens. And if you Google the term video deficit, you can find some of this, uh, some of this research literature. Um, so certainly you can learn from screens, but it's not the same experience. Um, and we've made enormous strides in the last 10 or 15 years in figuring out how to do this effectively. Um, but there are still issues that, we, that we're trying to overcome. Yeah, absolutely. So do you have recommendations about, you know, screen time and the amounts of how much should parents or teachers be thinking about the amount of time students are spending on screens? I mean, like most people, I'm, uh, you know, I'm very quick to say, well, it depends on what they're doing on their screens. Um, uh, but the truth is, like, if your child is unsupervised, uh, when they're, you know, uh, have a laptop or have an iPad or something, you kind of know what they're doing. It's not, they're not looking at Shakespeare concordances, you know, and there, there are data <laughs> on this, that they're, they're mostly consuming video content. They're texting their friends. I mean, the, the way I put it in, um, when students like school is they're basically doing the stuff that kids have always liked to do. And they're just doing it with technology. Now, when I was left to my own devices, when I was nine years old, when I was 15 years old, I was mostly not doing the most enriching things. Um, and so it's really less about like, you know, what, what do you want your kids to be doing? Is it really the screen per se, or is it that, gosh, I wish they were reading, you know, re reading more books, or I wish they were reading more nonfiction, or I wish they were working on their social skills more, whatever it is. Um, whatever it is you want them to do, uh, they can probably do it on a screen. They can probably do it off a screen. Uh, so you need to figure out how you're going to encourage your child to engage in more of the activities they want. I think the thing that really bugs people about screen time is screen time is mostly unsupervised. And yeah, most of what kids do when they're unsupervised on screens is, you know, in the long run, not super enriching. It's kind of fun for them, but not very enriching. I have to yeah, say like absolutely. we have plenty of rules in my house and like uh, this is especially acute with the pandemic. I mean, like like most parents, like we had lots of rules in my house and then the pandemic struck and I, all my wife and I are like, just play among us all you want. Like whatever, whatever it is, like, you know, this is just a nightmare for everybody. Like, you know, I can't blame you. Just do whatever you want to do. Do whatever keeps you saying, yes. Now, you know, so. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so we talked about screens. There's actually a comment from YouTube, uh, Venkat Parkinen, who says that more audio learning should be implemented. I never used audio learning in my high school, but it's so much powerful now. 
And so I wonder if, do you have thoughts about how learning is impacted by different communication methods or channels? Yeah, I mean, that's been um, pretty carefully researched when it comes to reading. So the comparison being reading text versus listening to an audio book. Um, I don't know that there's been a lot of research on, you know, audio learning more broadly. Um, there's a whole lot of over, so I'll, I'll comment on um, reading from print versus an audiobook. Um, there's a whole lot of overlap in the mental machinery that comprehends printed text versus listening to the same text, someone read the same text. Um, this is assuming that you are a very smooth, fluent decoder uh, when you're reading print. So in other words, going from print on the page to words in the mind is no problem for you. You're quite, you're quite facile with that. If you are, there's a whole lot of overlap um, between the two processes is basic because the processes that you use to comprehend written text is basically the same process that you use for oral language. There's some differences um, around the margins, which are not trivial. So one that's pretty obvious is when you're listening to a book, someone's reading it to you. And so you get uh, what, what uh, scientists call prosodic information. Prosody is the sort of music of, um, uh, of speech. And it's what tells you the difference between uh, what a great party and what a great party, right? So sarcasm is all a matter of prosody. Uh, and so in that sense, listening to a text is a little bit easier because the whoever's doing the reading is giving you that prosodic information. Uh, on the other hand, when you're reading print, it's very easy to move backwards in a text. Uh, you control the pace. You can read as quickly, as slowly as you want, and it's real easy to go backwards. So you, uh, and if you look at eye movements while people are reading, something like 10, 15% of eye movements are actually regressions where you're going back. You had a little bit of trouble unraveling the syntax of a sentence maybe. So you go back to pick up a few words. Um, in principle, you can go back when you're listening to an audio book, but in practice, it's kind of awkward and most people don't really do it. And of course, um, you're not in terrific control of the pace. Um, so that makes audiobooks slightly more difficult. So again, lots and lots of overlap, um, but the uh, some differences at the margins. Got it. Thank you. We've got a few more questions coming in um, on Facebook. So one of the things we keep hearing, and Shelley Costa Thompson asks a question related to that now, is how do you keep teens motivated, um, especially this year? But over time, just it, it seems to be an ongoing question of how we keep them interested in wanting to learn. How we, yeah, how we keep students interested in school. Yeah, I mean, particularly teens, but yes, <laughs> particularly teens. Yeah, and I don't know whether the question is really like from a par parental perspective versus from a teacher's perspective, because I think the it is. The she has a fourteen-year-old. <laughs> okay, so it's it's from a parental perspective. Yeah, no, I mean it. Yeah. It gets difficult because lots of other things crowd around uh, in on their time and. Teens in particular become extraordinarily interested in their social lives. Um, BJ Casey is a psychologist at Yale University, has a very good take on this, I think. She points out that this is practice for them. This is preparation for becoming independent of their parents. So they're becoming extremely attuned to their peers because they're now learning how to navigate this world where other people uh, are going to be important, important as, they, as they move out of their home. Uh, so with that kind of competition, you know, trig just does not seem to hold a whole lot of appeal. <laughs> Um, I think one of the one of the things that um, is important to do, and it's certainly not going to be a full blown solution, um, is to emphasize that this is a family value, and I hope that this is something that has been a family value all along, and to sort of acknowledge and validate. Like I get it that there are other things you're interested. In. I also get it, Mr. Willingham, your history teacher is pretty boring. Like that's legit. I'm not. I'm not saying that he's not. Uh, at the same time, like some things have not changed. And one of the things that hasn't changed is 
in this family, we take school seriously. You know, we show up on time. We, uh, we are uh, talk uh, politely to our teachers, all the sorts of things that you've been doing all along are important and one of, continue to be important. And one of the things that continues to be important is trying your best in all of your classes and making sure that you make time for that. So uh, in general, I'm, I'm very much a fan of trying to start with uh, positivity and trying to start with uh, sort of appealing to the best in sort of a teen sense of self, like sort of saying like, look, this is who you are, right? This is the best version of you that you want to be. You want to be the kind of, or you are the kind of person who treats school this way, as opposed to the punitive approach, like, well, look, you know, if you're not going to do your work, then I'm going to take your iPad away. Uh, because that's obviously not appealing to the best in the student. Um, and I also find that it, it, ends up being a little bit of a game of cat and mouse. It's sort of like, well, you know, you're not doing what I want you to do. Therefore, I'm going to do this to you. And that, to me, sort of sets up a bargain in the child's mind. Like, okay, so if I can still get away with not doing what you want me to do and retain my iPad, then I'm kind of winning. Whereas if I'm, if I'm appealing to their sense of self, then they themselves kind of know whether or not they're living up to that. Uh, so if I if I can do it, that's going to be my starting place. Got it. Thank you. And I know that's a whole uh, how to motivate teens could be a whole new series of series of books. <laughs> oh God, God uh, help us all. There. Yeah, I mean that's, <laughs> that's, that's a lot. So he's the father of two teens right now. This is a very difficult problem. <laughs> I, I feel your pain for sure. Definitely, definitely. Um, so you, in thinking about motivation, you know, we talked earlier about curiosity. I wonder if there's something to with um, the, you know, link thinking about motivation, curiosity. And I know you've talked recently about creativity too. And if there's, you know, appealing to students' creativity or opportunities there to encourage students and to keep being interested in learning. I, I think absolutely. I mean, and this is something that I think most parents want to do this. And I think most parents um, are, are doing it as, as much as they can. But encouraging creative outlets that are not necessarily part of school, I think, is a wonderful opportunity to keep kids engaged with learning. I mean, especially kids who are struggling a lot in a lot of their school subjects, that feeling that um, but because what what you're really worried about and sort of trying to guard against is a sense of self that doesn't include learning at all you know it's sort of like well school is not a place where i succeed school is not a place where i feel good about myself um and so that sort of extends to any type of learning that might happen period right because school's where you learn in contrast to if if a student can feel like, yeah, the stuff I do at school, like I really struggle with that, that's really hard for me. And I don't, I'm not sure I see that in my future for long term. But then there's this other content that I feel really passionate about. I, I know I'm good at that. Uh, and that entails learning and I'm good at that type of learning. Um, that seems like a, a really desirable way to go. And it does, obviously, it doesn't just apply to students who are struggling in school. This is, you know, having that passion, especially feeling like they can go deep on something. One of the things that I know is so frustrating for students is everything is, you know, sort of a million miles wide and two inches deep. And so getting to the point where they feel like they've re they're really getting mastery and like they know more about this than most adults do. That's like, you know, that's really exciting for them. Uh, and, you know, every kid deserves to feel that way. Absolutely. That seems like a good note. The half hour has flown by. So we will wrap it up there. Thank you so much for your time today. Again, folks, Dr. Dan Willingham, check out the second edition of his book that's out now. And the, uh, we'll remind all of you as well that tomorrow at the same time, we have Ben Gomes from, who will be talking about new learning initiatives at Google. Um, so you can join us then. Thanks again to Dr. Dan Willingham for joining us. All of you have a good day and we will see you next time. <laughs>